This is week seven out of uh, 24, if you're keeping track. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, please, as always, pay attention to the sign-in sheet on your table. Uh, just check the box if you're uh, here, and then uh, correct your email if there's a mistake. If you're new, write your email in so we know you're here. This is how we uh, keep track of everybody, keep information going through emails and stuff like that. And then uh, table leaders take that to the back table at the end of the morning. Appreciate that very much. Remind you as well on your table, there's a little half sheet talks about a service day we're trying to put together. Several of our guys have uh, served at a ministry called Riverwoods Christian Center over the years. Uh, it services uh, disadvantaged youth in our area. A great way just to spend a part of a Saturday morning or a Saturday morning, part of the afternoon. Saturday, November 14th, if you can help out there, some basic construction stuff, putting together some bunks and all that. Uh, Lee Norris is heading that up. Uh, his contact information is on this half sheet. You can give part of a day. Appreciate that very much. You'd have a lot of fun doing it with some other team guys. So let them know if you can do it. All right, here's our story for today. This is, uh, uh, I think this has probably made the cycle through the years as a team joke. I kind of keep the ones that work, and so this is one of my favorites. Okay. A big city lawyer went dunk duck hunting in rural Tennessee. He shot and dropped a bird, but it fell into a farmer's field on the other side of a fence. As the lawyer climbed over the fence, an elderly farmer drove up on his tractor and asked him what he was doing. The lawyer said, well, I shot a duck and it fell into this field. Now I'm getting it. The farmer replied, this is my property, and that's my duck, so you're not coming over here. The lawyer laughed and said, okay, okay, I'll give you $10 for the duck. The farmer goes, this is my property, and that's my duck. You're not coming over here. Now the lawyer gets impatient. Look, he says, I'm one of the best trial attorneys in the United States. You don't let me get that duck, I'll sue you and take everything you own. The old farmer smiled and said, apparently you don't know how we do things in Tennessee. We settle small disagreements like this with the Tennessee three-kick rule. The lawyer asks, what's the three-kick rule? The farmer goes, well, first I kick you three times, and then you kick me three times, and so on, back and forth until someone gives up. The attorney quickly thought about it, and he said he thought to himself he could take the old codger, so he agreed to abide by the local custom. So the old farmer slowly climbed down from the tractor, walked up to the city feller. He first, uh, his first kick planted the toe of his heavy work boot right in the lawyer's shin and dropped him to his knees. The second kick, um, to the, to his second kick was to the gut, and knocked the wind clear out of the, uh, of the of lawyer. The lawyer was flat on his belly now, and the farmer's third kick went to a kidney and nearly caused him to faint. The lawyer summoned every bit of his will and managed to get to his feet and said, okay, now you old coot, it's my turn. The farmer smiled and said, nah, I give up. You can have the duck. <laughs> all right. Um, our theme all season has been um, the legacy of a man's life. At the end of the day, the legacy of a man's life. And as I sent you in the little email, and I kind of hesitated to use that story of the, of the police officer who took his own life, or, or the peers that he took his own life, because it's so devastating. That story is just so devastating in so many ways. But it reminded me that we see stories around us all the time of legacy. Uh, every man's life leaves a legacy, one way or the other. And we see stories around us all the time, in the news, on the sports pages, of legacies, left that are extremely rich and legacies that are kind of wasted and ruined by decisions, sometimes even a single decision. And it's a little bit of a frightening thing, but that's why we're talking about the legacy of man's life. Uh, so far, we've talked about, about the legacy of love, legacy of faithfulness, of courage, strength, last week of truth, and today we're looking at the legacy of generosity. And it's kind of going to take a little turn that you may not anticipate, but the legacy of generosity. I'm going to show you a film clip. How many of you have seen the movie Gran Torino with Clint Eastwood? <laughs> All right, look at those hands go up. Uh, you might be surprised, but I found a couple of clips from that movie that I can actually show you. <laughs> a little bit of editing. I think we have three weeks in a row of Gran Torino clips um, because I found, I, I, I didn't watch it for a while, but when I finally saw it, I realized um, if you've watched the movie thoughtfully, there it's got an incredible, um, an incredible emphasis or incredible Christ figure, and it's played by Clint himself at the end of that movie. Um, but I'm not showing that scene. The scene I'm going to show you is the very end. It's the reading of um, Walter's will. Remember the whole story? He, uh, Clint Eastwood's character is a Korean War vet, bitter old man, uh, probably an alcoholic who uh, hates everybody. Uh, he especially hates this young Southeast Asian boy, a Hmong boy, who tries to steal his car, his Gran Torino, uh, as part of a gang initiation, but eventually comes to know this family and becomes a kind of a mentor and, and kind of starts to like this kid and forms a really sweet relationship with him, kind of an odd relationship, but a sweet relationship. And then 
gives his own life to save his sister and family from these thugs and all that. Anyway, this is the reading of Walt's will, and it's a, it's a, it's a clever way to talk about generosity. So take a look at the screen. Gran Torino. Walt Kowalski once said to me that I didn't know anything about life or death because I was an over-educated 27-year-old virgin who held the hands of superstitious old women and promised them eternity. Walt definitely had no problem calling it like he saw it. But he was right. I knew really nothing about life or death until I got to know Walt. And boy, did I learn. And I want to leave my house to the church because Dorothy would have liked it. Now, which brings us to our last item. And again, please excuse the language in Mr. Kowalski's will. I'm simply reading it the way it was written. And I'd like to leave my 1972 Grand Torino to... my friend... Tau Van Lore. On the condition that you don't chop top the roof like one of those beaners. Don't paint any idiotic flames on it like some white trash hillbilly. And don't put a big gay spoiler on the rear end like you see on all the other zipper heads cars. It just looks like hell. If you can refrain from doing any of that, it's yours. the movie that the, when you get to the end it really wasn't a surprise uh, what he did but you, what you saw was a transformation of a hardened cynical angry man uh, to a kind of a legacy of generosity and what he gave that the, the young Hmong boy um, in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount you'll see this verse printed in your notebook uh, Jesus says give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, here's where I want to begin. God is generous. God is generous. Uh, there was a theologian named A.W. Tozer, a pastor theologian, who had written many books. Uh, and one of the things he says, and I've quoted it here many times, I've heard Pastor Jeff use it in sermons, is he says, what a man thinks about God is the most important thing about him. Uh, what a man thinks about God is the most important thing about that man. And that's true. We think about God in all kinds of ways. Right here, even in this room, we can think about God as creator. For example, I go out to get the paper in the morning. This morning I went out to get it. It's about 4.15 in the morning, uh, and my paper's already there. Every time I go out and get the paper, I stop, and on a clear early morning, I can see the moon is right up in front of my house, and there's some bright stars near it, and one's a planet, and it's just breathtaking, and, I pa and there's just almost every morning, I notice, and I think just briefly of God as creator. I got to see my nephew's little son, who's only six weeks old, this past uh, Tuesday, and held him in my arms, and you forget 
how little they are when they're born. Six weeks old only weighs about eight and a half pounds. And I look at those little perfect little fingers and I think of God as creator. You can think of God as creator. Maybe you think of God as a kind of CEO of the universe in charge, but not paying that much attention to the details. Maybe especially not the details of your own life. Maybe you think of God as holy or as omnipotent. Maybe you think of God like the principal of your grade school when you just walk in the halls with a big paddle looking for someone doing something wrong. Remember back in the days when principals could paddle guys, right? Or maybe you think of him as mysterious and distant. Some of us in this room probably grew up with some kind of lousy visions of who God is or murky views of who God is. And one of the things I want to do through team is to clarify what you think about God. Here's a question. Do we think, in all these ways we think about God, do we think about God as generous? Do we think about God as generous? I think most of us, if we're honest, have a tendency to think about God. We don't say it out loud, but we tend to think about God as being just a little stingy. Just a little tight with his resources. I mean, he's got everything, right? He owns everything. He created everything. He can do anything. So he could, if he wanted to, Give me a little more than I have now. So we have a feeling that you might be holding back just a bit on us. Let me give you an example. My guess is all of you drove here today, unless you rode a bicycle or walked. I think pretty much everybody drove here today. And pretty much all of you have a car or truck, I would guess. Uh, how many of you are actually driving the car or truck of your ultimate dreams? Anybody driving their dream car? That's what I thought, okay? <laughs> a couple of you, well then more power to you, and I hate you already. But... <laughs> So here's how it goes. Uh, God, we have a car or truck. You know, I, God gives me a car or truck, gives you a car or truck. It's got an engine. It's got four pretty good tires. It's got power windows, heat, AC, DVD player. And so we're reasonably grateful to have a working vehicle. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we stop at a stoplight, just some random day somewhere. We look over to our left, and there's a dude driving our dream car, driving my dream car. For me, it might be a Lexus IS 300 maybe an Audi, and our gratitude, I speak personally, my gratitude can go right out the window. We're like, how come you gave him my car? What's up with that? How could you do that to me? How could you be holding back on me? I mean, I own five vehicles. Our family, we have five vehicles. They all have my name on them. My kids haven't bought them from me yet. I have five vehicles, and between them, I have over a million miles on them. Over a million miles. So I know exactly how this goes. And I can feel profoundly ungrateful for my Buick Century, okay? The truth is, when I stop to think about it, he's given me those five vehicles. When most of the world doesn't even have one. I have five. When most of the world doesn't have one, okay? He's given me everything I have. Leave aside the vehicles. He's given me life. He gives me the world around me, the stars I see in the morning when I pick up my paper. He gives me the capacity to see, hear, taste, touch, smell. He gives me the capacity to love and be loved. I have four healthy sons. I have a wife. People all around me who care about me if I pay attention to that. And that's even before I consider the stuff of my life. Here's what I want to learn to think about God. Here's what I want you to think about God. God is the most generous being in the universe. Secondly, the gospel is also generous. God is generous, and what we call the gospel is also generous. The most famous verse in the Bible is probably John 3.16. New Testament, book of John, chapter 3, verse 16, happens in a conversation with Nicodemus, and most of you can quote most of it by heart or pretty much get it right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Key word in there, gave. For God so loved that he gave. If you only remember one verse of the entire Bible, if you only take time to memorize one verse of the entire Bible, that verse summarizes the entire message of the Bible. But if we read on a little bit later in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul who was writing in the first century, goes into a little more detail. Now, these verses are not in your notebook. I wish I'd put them in there when I was planning this series in the summer, but I didn't. So I'm going to put these on the screen. Are they up there? Did they add these? Let's see. Yeah. All right. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 2, and Ephesians is a letter written in the first century to a group of people living in ancient Ephesus who were brand new to faith in Christ, living in a culture that was quite hostile toward that faith. 
not that different from the culture we live in today. And one of the things I believe about humanity is that human nature, human civilization does not change very much. Technology changes, human beings don't. So consider this written to us living in a culture that's hostile sometimes to what we say we believe. The Apostle Paul's writing, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's his way of referring to Satan, the great enemy of God. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That word wrath simply means judgment or punishment or separation from God. Last week I talked about truth, a legacy of truth. How the Bible corresponds with the reality I see in the world around me and with the reality I know of the world inside me. The Bible explains to me why things are the way they are and why I am the way I am. And here it is. The ruler of the kingdom of the air, the great enemy of God, Satan, is at work in the world. This is how the Bible explains what's wrong with the world. And uh, this whole story started in Genesis with Adam and Eve when the serpent entered the garden and said, God didn't really say... He really wanted you to do whatever you want to do. That's where it started. The result is then spiritual death. That is, spiritual death that leads to gratifying the cravings of the flesh. The Bible explains what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with me. That's why we have the whole story of Jesus. That's why we have John 3.16. Jesus wasn't some super nice guy who came to the world wearing sandals, teaching cool stuff about loving your enemies that you can put on the bumper sticker of your car. That's not why he came. Jesus was God's intervention in human history. Paul goes on, verse 4 of that same letter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. But because, hang on. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. These verses are summary of the entire story of the Bible. The world's a broken place. We are broken people. We are spiritually dead because of our sins. But God, in his love, made us alive in Christ. The question is, how? And many of you know this, but let me reiterate. Paul continues. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. It is not by works so no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, let me explain the gospel. Many of you know this, but for some of you this might be clearer than you've ever heard it before. The gospel, the center of the Bible, is not about religion. The gospel is not about religion. It's not about a list of rules that we try to follow as best we can so that we're acceptable to God so that we can become better people. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. He came to make spiritually dead people spiritually alive people through relationship with God. Now let me explain as clear as I can what it means to be a Christian. You don't become a Christian by being born into a Christian family. It's not what the Bible teaches. You don't become a Christian by being born in a Christian nation. That's not what the Bible teaches. You don't become a Christian by going to church. It's not what the Bible teaches. Or by being a pretty good person or by managing not to kill somebody in your life. You ask the average person on the street, well, do you think you're going to heaven? Well, yeah, I haven't killed anybody. That's not, the, that's not where the bar is set. Okay? That's not what it means. You become a Christian when you admit something's wrong inside of you. That you are bent toward selfishness, that you are bent toward this thing the Bible calls sin, that you in yourself cannot be good enough, cannot be good enough to qualify for acceptance by a holy God. That you're not good enough, you can't get there on your own, that you're spiritually dead without an intervention. And that intervention is Christ, and it happens by faith, not by being more religious. Okay? The good works don't come on the way to faith. The good works come after faith. That's what the Bible says. You become a Christian by believing that God came into the world in Jesus to die on a Roman cross as the final sacrifice of the sins of the world and for your sins, and he rose again to defeat sin and death forever. You become a Christian by intentionally inviting Christ to enter your heart and life through the Holy Spirit to forgive you and give you new spiritual life. That's how you become a Christian. And interestingly, you don't ever have to go to church to do that. You go to church as a result of that. Romans 10, Paul says it the clearest way possible. He says, 
a lot of loads. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by, with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. Now, there are process people and point-in-time people when it comes to faith. Some of you uh, came to faith in Christ at a point in time. That is, you were watching a Billy Graham crusade, you were in church, you were by yourself looking up at the stars at night, and there was a point in time when faith became real to you and you made a conscious decision, yes, I believe. And Christ invaded your life through the Spirit, and you felt that, and you know it, and you can point to the time, day, and hour when it happened. Others of you are process people, process guys. That is, you can't really point to time and place, but you know what right now you would say, yes, I know, I believe. But it took a long time. I talked to one guy who told me it took him 20 years to walk that journey until they could say for sure, but he didn't know exactly when it happened. But let me tell you this. If you're not sure that this is true of your heart and life, if you're not sure, if you've always thought it was about going to church, if you always thought it was about being religious, if you wonder if you've been good enough, let me encourage you as strongly as I can to sometime, maybe even today, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, sometime when you're by yourself, when you're in your car, or you're walking around your block, or you're sitting at your desk, here's what you say. You confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, I believe. I know something's broken inside of me. I cannot save myself. I cannot forgive myself. I need your intervention in my life and consciously ask him to become Lord of your life, and he will. That's a signed contract. That's a done deal. Create a point in time in your own heart and mind. That's what it means to become a Christian. Now, what does it mean to be saved? It means to be saved from something, to be saved from the consequences of our own sin, which is spiritual death, separation from God, and saved for something that is the purpose for which we were each created, to worship and serve an eternal God now and forever. And I believe that the Bible teaches that the gospel transforms people and transform people, make an impact in the world. Jesus changes how we think about God, not as distant, not as out there somewhere, CEO of the universe, but personal. He knows you. He knows me. He knows you by name. Changes how we think about ourselves. We're broken and sinful people. T changes how we think about salvation. It's by grace. Grace means it's a gift. It's God's gift accepted by faith. It's not by a bunch of religious deeds that we do. Changes how we think about other people. Changes how we think about the world. Changes how we live our lives. New priorities, new values. Not in, we, are, we, we live certain ways not in order to get to heaven, but because we know we have been given heaven as a gift. The gospel is generous because God is generous. And thirdly, the gospel produces generous people. The gospel produces generous people. Paul finishes his comments by saying, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See that? God invades our lives through faith, and then we live out the rest of our lives in gratitude for that gift. My second son, Jesse, is 23 years old, graduated from Taylor University last spring. Uh, degree in psychology, so he's trying to figure out what to do with his life, whether he goes to grad school, whatever. So he took a couple of experiences this past summer. One of them was going to Haiti for two weeks to serve in an orphanage with his cousin. His cousin had a connection down there. So he just bought his plane ticket, went down to Haiti for two weeks just to serve among the poorest of the poor. Had an incredible experience. But one day at this small, tiny little orphanage in a... Uh, forlorn place in Haiti, uh, Tim Tebow showed up. That's right, you know, the Tim Tebow showed up at this orphanage, unannounced, no cameras, no reporters. He runs a foundation, part of his foundation serves children with special needs, and this orphanage focuses on children with special needs in Haiti. And so he came to this orphanage because he had heard about it, and he was considering offering the help of his uh, foundation to this particular orphanage. So he shows up, well, shows up one day, my son gets to meet Tim Tebow. Now, whatever you think about Tim Tebow as a football player, and evidently there are, how many NFL teams are there, 31, 30, 32? All 32 think he's bad at football, okay, because nobody will hire him to play football. Whatever you think of him as a football player, he is a celebrity, and he's wealthy. He can probably make $50,000 per speech at churches, let alone businesses. Yet he's in Haiti, unannounced, without reporters, given his time, to visit this orphanage. I believe that's a form of generosity. And I believe the gospel always produces generosity when it touches people's lives. When we truly understand and experience what God has given to us, we become more generous as people. Generosity takes many forms. It can take the form of giving our resources, our wealth. That's what we think of first. 
we're in this room here today. We have this room because a lot of people over a lot of time have given up their resources to allow each one of these bricks to be set in place, right? And many of you have contributed to this. Uh, our church is, has, does things like uh, puts freshwater wells in Uganda and small communities because people give of their resources to make that happen. Many of you have given to make that happen. But we can also give our talents and skills. There are men, some of them in this room, who offer financial guidance on Wednesday nights to people who are in dire need of financial advice at our East Campus. That's a skill that can be given as an act of generosity. Others of you offer your, your handiwork skills with a ministry called Master's Hands. There are brochures back there on the table because you know how to do, fix stuff, and you fix stuff for widows and, and for single moms. We give our talents, our skills, and we can give our time. And for many of us, this is the most difficult gift, our time. For me, it is the most difficult gift to give time. Uh, we have this service day coming up for Riverwoods that, that Lee is putting together. That just takes some time. But time is sometimes the most precious commodity. But it's a form of generosity to give our time and our care to someone or something. Part of the reason I'm a, I'm a pastor today, and there are many reasons, but part of the reason is a 14-year-old boy who happened to be a Hmong boy, just like in the movie, that I met 34 years ago. Many of you have heard this story. I want to tell it briefly because it's an example of the power of generosity. Uh, I was 25 years old. I uh, got an internship for seven weeks in inner city Pittsburgh at a church right down in inner city Pittsburgh across the, a park from, a, from a, a, get a, a slum area. And the pastor there uh, signed me. Uh, he said he didn't really know what to do with me, so he said, why don't you uh, spend the seven weeks, get to know the, the Hmong community that's right across the, the city park. They've all come to this country as refugees. They have lots of kids. Maybe you can do something with the kids. So I spent seven weeks trying to do something I knew nothing about ministry, really, other than what I learned from my father growing up in the church. I tried to get to know these Hmong kids. There was a group of about 15 of them. So I got to know them. Uh, and one of the things I noticed early on in that seven weeks, maybe the first week I was there, I lived in a little apartment upstairs in the church, and I could look out my window at about 11 o'clock at night, and I would see uh, lights bobbing up and down in the city park right across the street from the church. It looked like giant fireflies. Six, eight, ten of them, just lights bobbing up and down. I, I kept what is, what's, what's with the, they're too big to be fireflies. What's going on in the park? It's 11 or 12 at night. So finally one night, I, uh, early on, I got out of my, I left. I was a little bit nervous about going into the park at night. This is kind of a dangerous area. I walked out there, and what I found was it was the Hmong women and children with flashlights, and they were digging up night crawlers, worms, because they had discovered that they could sell night crawlers at the wharf, at the fishing wharfs down at the three, at the three rivers in Pittsburgh, and fishermen would buy them for $7 for a gallon jug, okay? So they're filling up gallon jugs with night crawlers for seven bucks per, I don't know how long it took to fill one jar of night crawlers. That's what they were doing. So I got to know these kids. One of the boys I got to know was a kid named Neng. He was 14 years old. And Neng was a problem. He was angry. He was, he, w he didn't, he, English was rough and he would, he cursed all the time. He was, needed attention. Uh, he, he was just really rough to have around, but he always came around. He was disruptive um, and, I, I, I didn't like when he came around. But by about the second or third week, I realized he was going to come around, so I tried to get to know him better. So I started taking him off uh, on his own and, and just, just trying to get to know the kid. Eventually, eventually, he trusted me enough to tell me part of his story. And his story was he and his family escaped um, the genocide happening in Southeast Asia with the Hmong people under the Khmer Rouge, had to swim across the Mekong River when he was 12 years old. Uh, he saw his father killed in the front yard of his house. He and his siblings and his mother swam across the river, went three miles wide. He finished. He was coughing up blood. They were shooting at him in the river. And I kept thinking, when I was 12 years old, I played Little League Baseball. So I started to understand a little bit about Nang, why he was the way he was. And we started to forge a little bit of a relationship, and he started to calm down. By the fifth week or so, he was okay to have around, and we had this little friendship. So seven weeks went by, and I needed to go back to my life, back to school, back to my uh, whatever I was doing next. And uh, so we had a little going away party, took the kids out for ice cream, and then we came back to, my, to the church. And we're all saying our goodbyes, and the kids all left, and I went up to pack to go on with my life. Well, about half an hour, 45 minutes later, I hear somebody shouting at me from the, from the sidewalk out in front of the church, Brian, Brian! I look out, and it's Ning on his little Stingray bike, had a hat on backwards, motioning for me to come down. So I went downstairs, I don't know what he wanted, and he said to me real quick, he said, he took an envelope out of his back pocket, all folded up, and he said, this for you. Maybe you buy some food. And he jumped on his bike, and he rode away. 
And I stood there for a long time, and I was afraid to open the envelope because I thought I knew what was inside. I opened it up, and there was a $10 bill in there. And I knew what it cost him to get that $10. He dug worms every night. And what hit me was I gave a little bit of time. Then I went on with my life. I gave a little bit of time. He gave me a gift that changed my life. And it was all because of generosity. I think that's the power of generosity. That's the legacy of generosity. Here's three questions I want you to talk about around your tables today. First, do you tend personally to think of God as being generous or as slightly stingy with his resources? Just, just be honest. Do you think of him as being slightly stingy? Like I talked about, maybe not. Maybe you do. Secondly, who is the most generous person you know? Don't just think of money. Think of time. Think of attitude. Think of gifts. Who's the most generous, spirited person you know? And third, in what area of your life would you like to become more generous? Is there an area of your life you think, you know, in that area, I do tend to be a little closed-fisted? Where would you like to be more generous? Talk about it. Grab some coffee. Wrap you up right before 7 o'clock.